Marvel jackets. They're the height of fashion, in black, silver, or spidey blue. And they look cool, too. $75 each. You can walk through your neighborhood in swinging style. Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast, Jeff and Merck present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of the most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. And you will be their savior. Your strength will be their shield and your will their sword. You remain unbroken for your random banter is eternal. What do you got? I got nothing. I it, It's sword and sorcery. It's got to be, but I don't know. I'll, I'll give you a hint. What did I do for uh, last week's? Uh, or was it? I did the uh, opening line of the Doom Eternal video game. Right. Okay. This is the closing line of the Doom <laughs> Eternal video game. Still haven't played it, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know. <laughs> nice and little niche. We're a niche of a niche, and I'm doing a niche. Uh, why would I pick the uh, ending line of the Doom Eternal video game for uh, this random banter? This is the closing chapter, quote-unquote, of the... Uh Revenge of the Boogeyman? Yeah, well, more along the lines for, I believe, Power Pack, it is the end of the line for the Inferno storyline. So, okay, all right. It was the end of a line. <laughs> exactly. I, th- I thought it was a nice little bookend there. Also, I like Doom a lot, so uh, anything anywhere I can squeeze that in, I'm quite happy. <laughs> I just thought that it might be because, you know, since you're stuck inside, you were doing nothing but playing Doom all the time. No, I don't get to play video games or watch TV or do a lot of stuff. I get to do a lot of chores and uh, parenting. That's just as fun. That's a lot like Doom then. Yeah, that's exactly like Doom. <laughs> it is uh, when uh, if you just replace like a <laughs> like any of the demons uh, with uh, diapers and <laughs> any of the, you know, the, the different cool level designs with uh, the same uh, house floor plan. I'm your guy. <laughs> You've got to be doing something a little bit more fun than just that. I don't know. What, what else you got going on there? Uh, reading, working in the yard, visited with parents a little bit ago. Uh, it's raining today, which is beautiful and awesome. and yeah. makes me really happy because, for one, it was like, oh, cool, it's a rain day, so let's stay inside. Been busy all day. I'm also really happy about it because I've just been feeling like under the weather and blowing my nose tons and tons and tons. And I'm trying to figure out why when I can actively see pollen just moving through the daylight (laughs) and blowing across the street like a snowdrift. And when I walk outside, it just puffs up like dust in an old Western. I'm like, man, why do I have to blow my nose so much? Pollen, pollen, pollen. pollen. So I'm like, it's raining. Cool. Knock it out of the sky. Give me a break. I don't really have allergies, but man, this year has just been like, just its physical presence in my body has been killing me. So (laughs) I'm I'm happy to have it kind of get knocked out of the air for a little bit. I've got seasonal allergies, which means that I usually am miserable the entire year. Yeah. I have a a friend who is uh, colloquially known as a bubble girl, because as soon as spring (laughs) through summer hits... She is in a bubble. She's inside. She just, she just, it's like, hmm, it's nice out. Close those windows shut (laughs) because I can't exist in it. So (laughs) I'm usually better about it now. I finally have got a good combination of drugs working for me, but I have been feeling the allergens really pick up. I've been feeling a lot of good times and fun times and please, please let me just get through this and not sneeze and, you know, make everybody at work go, oh my God, you've got COVID and you know, flip out. <laughs> yeah. I guess we should say we are recording this on April 22nd. So we are still in the midst of shutdown land. You know, hopefully by the time this airs, uh, we're still going to be shut down. Yeah, we're still going to be shut down. <laughs> Yeah, by the time this airs, uh, half of the United States will have probably tried to reopen and shut back down again. So, you know, to our future selves, we told you so. Yeah. (laughs) Sad. Cry, cry, cry. We already knew. We already know the future. It's just, it's going to be what it is, and then we'll get over it. And uh, it'll be a, a recollection for people in the future. Something like that. Yeah, besides that, I've been mostly doing stuff around the house. We ordered a bike for my wife, a tricycle for my wife on Amazon. So last Friday, I built that for her and kind of been going out like once a night, 
riding around nice. the block with her, and she's been enjoying that. My daughter's been on her little scooter next to her saying, go faster, mommy, and my <laughs> wife's saying, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary until you get used to it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got that done, but that meant we had to clean out the garage so we could fit that in there. And then that meant we had to clean out the shed because I put everything in the shed. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday, I was trying to like, okay, I'm going to mow the lawn. I'm going to clean out the shed. That's the goal. I got the shed cleaned. I got a portion of the lawn mowed. And then I found myself tied up in two, count them, two Longbach Crusade type of podcasts so yeah i ended up winning the six square on the lbc doing it live program that was a lot of fun i enjoy hanging out with those guys uh, later on that day i got together with clinton robinson who does their fan film fridays on their network and we sat down and we discussed a predator fan film called predator dark ages which was 30 minute fan film that was really kind of fun i i had enjoyed watching it i enjoyed talking to him about it it was kind of fun talking with uh, Clinton Robinson. I've never had a chance to, you know, really converse with him online. So that was kind of fun. That's really cool. Yeah, uh, you told me about that. And I'm like, I need to check that out. And I haven't yet, but it is on my list of to-dos. <laughs> 30 minutes. I mean, you and Hillary can watch it with a kid. I'm, it, it won't scar her any more than, you know, you being her father. No, uh, she's pretty scarred from that already. <laughs> don't want to do any. I don't want to do excessive <laughs> trauma to her. I want to do an acceptable parenting level of trauma. So... <laughs> Speaking of parenting trauma, hey, mm -hmm. hey, <laughs> that, that segue. is called a segue. Yeah, it's got... not just a river in Egypt. No, it. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, got to reboot my head here. That that is not your Skype. That is not your Skype failing. That was me freezing. Okay. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm like, ah, cool. I just shut down Rick. Early recording session tonight. <laughs> And done. <laughs> we have here a lot of parental trauma. Actually, it's the opposite. Instead of the parents doing trauma on the kids, it's the kids doing trauma on the parents, who kind of then go around and do trauma back on them. But before we can actually talk about this issue, Jeff, how do we get here? Give us the recap from last episode in two sentences. Go! Jim is getting ready to take his family on a road trip to Aunt Pauline's when his old boss, Carmody, visits from way out of the area and wants to take him and his wife out on the town for a night they won't forget while leaving the kids at home. Well, the power kids decide to track down their parents and have an adventure across New York where they help a lady find her baby before they find their parents who tell them that they love them before Carmody has to catch a flight back to his new home. Now that the... It's strong, and it's sudden, and it's cruel sometimes, but it might just save your life. Two-sentence replay is over. Why don't you give me a beer and tell us what our power pack pick is? <laughs> give me a moment. Give me a moment. That was good. <laughs> 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 that was a fun little retelling of what just happened. All completely accurate. All completely accurate, and so does not tell the story from last episode. <laughs> Also, Inferno, Inferno, Inferno. <laughs> yeah. Um, well done, sir. <laughs> and for that, I owe you a beer, my friend. Oh, I will accept your beer. <laughs> Jeff and I are doing our recording not in each other's presence because we are practicing safe social distancing. But I have planned ahead and I have provided Jeff some nice little packages of beer for him to open up on these special, special days. So, Jeff. Why don't you open up that uh, piece of paper that says episode 57 and uh, tell me what you got inside. All righty. Let's see what we got. We have a matchless shared table, Saison <laughs> table beer. <laughs> I wonder why it's a shared table. <laughs> it's so hard to tell. What with, uh, you know, that's where the family, that's where the power family gathers around, have their meals and have their discussions and stuff. Uh -huh. And uh, spoilers, it's um, the table that the parents just kind of share when they are desperately waiting for their su newly discovered superhero children to come home or just worry if they have died. And then when the kids get home safe, they have a little breakdown. So it's a shared table of misery. <laughs> That is pretty darn close to my thinking behind it. We always talk about the family's table and how it's the centerpiece for them being a family. Well, this issue shows that family tearing apart. And you're right. It does happen around their shared table. Also, the pack is sharing their table of this book with some members of the New Mutants. Ah, that is a follow-up part that I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have cued in on. You know, the they with the New Mutants even shared a table at the uh, end. Yes, they did. Uh, at the end of uh, a section of the book. Yeah, yes. yeah. 
<laughs> so, yeah, go ahead and open that on up and we can start pouring and I'll tell, talk a little bit more about Shared Table by Matchless mm-hmm. Brewing. Mm. This is a 5.6 ABV. This is their take on a true Belgian Saison. It hits and highlights all the right places that are synonymous with the style while still being easy drinking. The aroma touts lemon and light peppery nose. The palate pops with a combination of fruity and spicy characteristics brought on by the yeast and hops and is balanced with soft, complimentary malt notes. All of this fades gently with a crisp, dry finish that's once again true to style. The name comes from where this beer is best served, shared with friends, at a table, over a tasty meal. I think we got one of those things I'm sharing of this with somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, you're my friend. You are my friend, too. And if we could be at a table together, we'd share it there. I have poured it so poorly that I have a glass full of foam. I see yours as well. You have a half glass of foam. I have a full. Yeah, I was doing the the sideways beer pour on that while I was reading, too. And yeah. there we go. No, so was I. And I'm like, it is. it smells like bubble gum to me. As soon as I open it, I'm like, wow, that smells like bubble gum. You get okay, what I'm saying? I can, I can, I can get there. Yeah. But I, I still so, am also getting a little bit of that, that lemon. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm getting the maybe... lemon and I'm getting the... Uh, the peppery. Yeah, the kind of the peppery and everything. But it's just for whatever reason, the aromatics on it hit my nose exactly just like a hubba bubba. Yeah, I, I can kind of get that. But I, I, don't want, I don't think that's a really the main leading force. Well, I'm sure the flavor, that aroma is going to change drastically when I can actually get a, a sip of this in. <laughs> it's very light. It's got a... It, it is it is uh, translucent, but it is crazy pale. When you pour it, it is it almost looks like water. And then it gets a, a, a lovely uh, yellow color going to it. Like a Coors Light type of a... Yeah, it does have Coors Light coloration, but when I poured it, I was like, this is clear, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, it is... Uh, it is super, super fizzy. And the uh, flavor on it is, it's a Cesson. It's very, it does have the lemony and on the, on the, you know, about halfway through the lemon fla- kind of flavor on your tongue, you get a peppery flavor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it does say, you know, I think the bottle says that it's tart and sweet and all sorts of stuff. Lightly tart, soft and pillowy, crisp and dry. It's an accurate descriptor. I gotta say, everything on here describes it pretty correct. I, maybe the soft complimentary malt notes. Yeah. I mm-hmm. could see this being really good with a meal. I think just on its own straight, you need something else to cut through some of the tart flavor. Having this with a nice uh a pork? Yeah, I was thinking uh, some sort of meat. Yeah, pork with some um, mashed potatoes. Yeah, it would go really good with uh, like pork chops. Mhm. This is this is I think this would be a very good summer beer having pork chops out on a bit, on, on a back deck. Yes. Very much so. Now, this is going to be a interesting, uh, nice little beer. Uh, it's it doesn't jump out any anything else, but it's uh, like I said, this probably is a good beer to have just with some uh, nice, tasty, tasty food. Yeah, at a table. This is definitely a food beer. We have a beer. I think our table is set. <laughs> Let us move on and go to the opening credits, if you please, Jeff. Power Pack issue number forty four, March nineteen eighty nine. What price victory? Credits. Juliana Jones, special guest scripts. June Brigman, special guest pencils. Woohoo! <laughs> Yay, June's back. Hilary Barda, special guest inker. Joe Rosen, letterers. Glennis Oliver, colors. Carl Potts, edits. Tom DeFalco, same old editor in chief. Featuring Power Pack, Alex Power, aka Destroyer, leader and energy distributor. Julie Power, a.k.a. Molecula, Mistress of Density, Density and Bubble Distributor. Jack Power, a.k.a. Counterweight, Gravity and Sarcasm Distributor. Katie Power, a.k.a. Starstreak, Flight and Rainbow Distributor. Guest starring, Mr. and Mrs. Power. Now that they know about their kids and the powers they have, they are not very happy with it. The New Mutants. Mirage, co-leader of the New Mutants. She can create solid form images of whatever anyone wants or fears. Warlock, our favorite shape-changing robotic-looking alien. Sunspot, immense strength. And never written well in this book. Gossamer, a pale and shapely alien that has some empathetic powers. Okay, here we are at the final part of the Revenge of the Boogeyman trilogy. And it looks like the New Mutants will be guest starring, and the Power Parents know about the Power Kids' powers. So no more lying, and Inferno is burning itself out. Ah, life is good. Dude, first, 
It is always Inferno. There are always consequences. Second, do you really think that dropping that truth bomb and running is going to be okay? Do you? Do you? There is trauma and drama, buddy. Whatever. Look at these kids, drawn in all the June Brigman glory, diving into battle with a loud power pack attack. Boom! That is how you make an entrance. Not gonna lie to ya, the kids are on their A game while they're throwing some fists, whap, 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 and the demons and saving some humans. Alex is blasting them, Julia is hopping and hammering, Jack is punching, Katie is swooping in airlift style and saving people. Yeah, but the kids are getting tired. Last issue, they did their group healing spell before the emotional and traumatic interaction with the Boogeyman and their family. And now they are out handling the heated hordes from Hades without so much as a hot pocket. And it is insane! I mean, not only are there actual demons, but there are also limbo-warped lampposts shooting lasers and old ladies to rescue. Are you a grandma? Don't worry, ma'am. I'll save you from those monsters. How's this for a grandma, dearie? <laughs> and at that, the little old lady in her Sunday best suddenly starts to transform. Her hands become meaty claws, and her mouth and teeth grow in size equal to that of an R-O-U-S. I think that it is actually a harpy that Katie thought was a grandma. That is possible, but Julie earlier did state that people are being transformed, much like Carmody was. So, I guess it's up for debate. What isn't up for debate, though, is that Katie is freaked out by this and is tiredly trying to fly away from the now-winged monstrosity. Eek! Come to Granny, dearie! Katie is caught in the clutching claws of Chiraptera clad chameleon. Seeing the peril, Alex blasts the creature into letting go of Katie, and Julie catches her young sister in a cloud of bubbles, demonstrating the awesomeness of her new power. Blomp. The demon grandma lands near Jack and is quickly dispatched. And a super posy G punch takes care of the harpy! Take that, you old bat! Hee <laughs> hee! Unfortunately, as the family regroups and tries to take a breather, the demonic denizens decide to renew their destructive push on the powers. Before the infernal pig pile can happen, which the kids are honestly not looking forward to, a giant hole appears in the sky. Normally, I would say, hey, that's odd, but <laughs> inferno. Yeah, well, think space balls and the shield around the planet and Mega Maid pulling all the air out of the hole. That is kind of what is happening to the demons. Well, that sucks. No. Well, it does, but also no. It is a good thing. That's what I meant. Anyway, the kids are relieved that this is finally over. They have been fighting all night, and it is now dawn. A fact that they only realize when they are flying home. This is also the moment that the kids think about their parents and how they must still be up and worried about them. Worried? Worried? Worried is an understatement. Their parents are going to be freaking out from dusk till dawn about this and all the other unwelcome revelations and experiences that they have received over the last, what, 12 odd hours? You know, I think that you might be right. This is going to get messy. Sure enough, Jim and Maggie are still up and sitting at their kitchen table, their shared kitchen table, but they are not worried, not even in the slightest. No, instead they have these really forced smiles on their faces and they offer the kids a nice friendly greeting. Welcome home, kids. How'd it go? Glad you're not hurt. Want a snack? The kids say that they are tired, but they can stay up and talk. But the parents shoo them off to bed, saying that hard-working superheroes need their rest. As the kids walk off to bed, they discuss this turn of events. Mom and Dad are acting kind of funny. Mom's hugs are all stiff. Something's wrong, Alex. They're not reacting in a way that's at all real. Aw, they're just trying to act normal. They'll adjust. We've all just got to get some sleep. Don't worry about Mom and Dad. They'll be fine. Sure. Sure, Alex. You really nailed that inside check, didn't you? Let's just look at how fine they are. As soon as the kids leave the room, the parents start to shake and fall apart. The next morning, the forced smiles are back. Beep, beep. Yeah, and it is noticed. Jim and Maggie are looking more like marionette dolls than actual people, and Alex calls them out on it. The facade breaks a bit as Jim explains that they have decided to just act like all is well. The reasoning is like this. The kids lied and hid their powers. The parents have no control. So why bother? Alex thinks this is a pile of blue alien sawdust. 
They know this is a big deal wrapped around some traumatic experiences, and the kids want to talk about it. But Pop Power kind of weighs his hand at it all, slaps on a fake smile, and asks them how they got their powers. This is too much for Maggie. She leaves the room, crying. Katie follows her mom into the kitchen. Mommy? Mama? Uh, are you crying? Yes, Katie. Yes, she is. And it really is because of you. Ouch! Harsh, but fair. Maggie tries to cover it up and hides behind packing Katie a lunch for school. She also tells Katie to be careful crossing the street, but then catches herself because they are superheroes, and they fight monsters and aliens, and they do more dangerous things than cross the street. I mean, what could she possibly be thinking? She is nothing more than a mere mortal who doesn't know that her children are more dangerous than a small army battalion. What right does she have to say anything to these gods amongst men? <laughs> oh man, I bet these kids really thought the parents were so stupid when they would worry about stuff like crossing the street. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa there, buddy. Turn the knob down to reasonable, and let's focus just on the couple in the story. You mean the crazy couple in the story? Yeah. It sure looks that way. Margaret is a mess now, and Jim comes over to comfort her. He tells the kids to head off to school. But, Dad, there's no school today. The city is a mess. People need our help. Oh, for crying out loud, kids, hasn't this family been through enough for one week? After Alex points out that the demons are gone, but the people still need their help, they decide to just get out of the house. Well, most of them do. Julie is skeptical about leaving their obviously distraught parents, but Alex is sure they just need time to calm down. Besides, they are safe at home, and the pack has to concentrate on the many who are in serious danger. Gotta save the world, yo! As Julie continues to brood on this choice, the kids come across an older man who seems to be caught by a car. Come again? Okay. Um, they see a guy who is caught in the tire hands of a car. Not better. Dude is being carjacked by an auto? I really want to get out of this routine, so this explanation needs to be really dumbed down or really smartened up. Your choice. Okay, let's just say that there was some demon juice animating things like cars and lampposts and, if you can believe it, vacuum cleaners. But since the sky hole appeared... The juice is worn off and the demonized objects have become inert, but still in whatever demon form they had been given. Hence, the older man who seems to be caught by a car's tire hands. Okay. Alex disintegrates the tire, freeing the man, but apparently there must have been some magic in that old silk hat, because Alex's destroyer power reactivates whatever demonic energy remained in the vehicle, and now that lethal Lincoln from Limbo is looking for... Revenge! revenge. It is short-lived revenge, though, as Jack dismantles the animated antagonistic Otto with an allotment of amply grabbed aggression. Or to put it another way... Stand back, bro. Let's see if it can stand up to the energy released by my positive gravity super punch. Pow. Way to go, Jack. It's just a regular car again. Er, sort of. Guess I... <laughs> Knocked the H-E double hockey sticks out of it. Get it? No need to thank us, sir. Up, up, and away. How do I explain this to my insurance? While this was going on, the two sisters have helped a couple down from the cold, frozen embrace of some demon-warped street lamps. Next up on their Funhouse Mirror Missions is a bus. Make that a bedeviled bus full of sobbing people. The transport has transformed into a terrifying terrestrial trout, trapping the travelers tightly. Julie misses inside to let the public know that all is well, and discovers that the oven-like thing smells like cat barf, and that the fleshy interior was trying to digest the passengers before it just stopped. Julie misty steps back out and says that the passengers are running out of air. This causes Alex to forget all about the lesson he learned all of two minutes ago, so he starts to disintegrate the ribs. No, Alex! Remember the car! Too late! It came alive! It's charging! Gangway! Jack pulls Alex out of the way of the speeding demonic downtown express, and Julie successfully uses her new bubble barrier ability to catch the bus. She tells Alex to now disintegrate the baby back bus ribs to let the people out and to hurry as she can't hold it for long. The passengers all exit the bleaker bus, and just in time, too. Uh-oh. I can't hold it. It's breaking away. Look out, Alex. Chill, Julie. I got it covered. Tracked. Shortly after the Powerball smoke clears, we find the family transporting the passengers on the bus's roof's remains to a hospital. Alex realizes that he is recognizing landmarks now, so the demonic energies must be dissipating slowly, 
returning things to normal. Well, what isn't normal is the scene they find at the hospital. All the patients are out on the street being tended to by medical staff. Apparently, an x-ray machine came to life and started attacking everyone before it was pushed down an elevator shaft. The hospital is trashed, and a lot of the staff have been injured. Holy cow! The doctor informs him that, yes, in his country, they are. But that doesn't matter now. What matters to him is that these children in front of him seem to be a little young to be superheroes. This time he's Alex for some reason. But never you fear! Mirage and the New Mutants are here to lay down a layer of lies to cover for the fantastic family of four and say that they are their youngest teammates. The New Mutants would have introduced them to the Doctor earlier, but they had to take a detour through space, as one does, and they only just got back. The Doctor either believes this pointless falsehood or just doesn't care as he watches the two teams greet each other. No, what he cares about is getting a small army of medical professionals here to help him with the patients and an equal number of construction workers to rebuild the hospital. Well, lucky for him, Mirage is here. She plucks this desire from the Doctor's mind and makes it a reality as an army of trained professionals, both medical and constructional, appear in front of him. She tells him that they are his for the duration and just need marching orders. He tells her that if they can get the ER operational, that that would be the most helpful. So, with a, come on mutants, let's do it! But we're not. The combined team charge straight into a montage of restoration and recuperation work. Turn on the montage music! Destruction crew, destroyer and warlock. Lifting crew, counterweight and sunspot. Construction crew, mirage and sunstreak and earth. Mirage, mirages. Comfort crew, gossamer and molecular. Whoa, 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 their montage narration. That sounds just a tad racy. We should say that Julie is creating a comfy layer of bubbles to cover for the lack of beds, while Gossamer is using her emotion powers to soothe the injured patients since the hospital is out of morphine. And is that better? Let's say yes. And now, moving on, as we all know, the aftermaths of a montage is sleepy time exhaustion. The young heroes have worn themselves out, but they have made an impressive effort and carried the load until the Army Corps of Engineers arrives to take over. Essions! Uh, what? Essions! It's the motto for the Army Corps of Engineers. It means, let us try. Uh... You know what? I'm just going to tell you later. For now, with the Army on the scene, the kids pack it up and head off. But before the Nubians head back to their own book, they... Have a quick fight? Get kidnapped? No, amazingly not. They share a very nice moment sitting on the roof watching the sunset. Mirage takes the time to explain what the heck has been going on with the fire demons and Ileana and the big hole in the sky and yada yada yada. This is where Power Pack learns that Magic sacrificed herself to stop this. And she turned back to a six-year-old little girl again. Wow, that's amazing. This means that she's going to have a chance to grow up without the terror of a demon realm. She has the chance to have a wonderful, full life. She, she, what? What are you, what are you looking at me like that for? Um, do you, do you remember the legacy virus storyline from the mid nineties? No, uh, no, not really. Why? What happens? You know, let's just stay in the happy place for now. Okay. You mean the happy place of Alex informing the new mutants about the demon boogeyman and their parents finding out about their powers, and things being really awkward and the tight power family is just coming apart? You know, when you paint that bleak picture with grays and blues and blacks, it does sound a little bad. In fact, Alex is brought to tears as he admits that they have destroyed their family. They didn't even stick around to try and help them to adjust to the new world order. They just, you know, left to go be heroes. Danny and the New Mutants try their best to give some emotional support, but it's with a heavy heart that the two teams go their separate ways. Power Pack flies home to a quiet house, and shortly, they find a very disturbing scene. Mom's in a dark room holding a little doll, singing a lullaby. This is creepy with a capital EEP, and Dad is not much better. He, too, is sitting in that same dark room, and he's just monologuing about what unfit parents they are, and how the kid's childhood is gone, and how they never knew. Sob. Repeat. Sob. Repeat. The kids try to talk to the parents and to help them, but they're broken. And without an advanced degree in therapy, a healthy dose of pharmaceuticals, or, you know, like a magic space wand, these broken eggs are not going to get back together anytime soon. Magic, you say? 
Hmm. Well, I may not have magic, but I do have a small gaggle of mutants that I can pull out of my hat. Mirage, Sunspot, Warlock, and Gossamer enter the apartment and start to lay one incredible story on. Utilizing Gossamer's soothing empathy power and some pretty amazing storytelling from Mirage, this is the whopper that they tell the power parents. You see, their buddy Magic, that crazy little goofball, well, she opened up this big old pipeline into a really nasty place, and all of these rambunctious little critters got out and started doing all these goofy little things around the city. What a riot, huh? Anywho, well, one of the little problems, children, was your old buddy Carmody. Yeah, we met him once. Not big fans, huh? <laughs> well, we just did not have time for that, silly Billy. So we had him stored in that nasty place, and <laughs> wouldn't you know it, the Big lug broke out. Now, here's the really awkward part. We just didn't have the time to deal with him and everything else. I mean, what a mess, am I right? So we hooked up a special team based on your kids. That's right, these kids right here to tackle your old boss. Kind of played into his little wacky and totally fake conspiracy theories that your kids had powers. I mean, your normal everyday kids having powers. You know, that's just crazy town. I mean, look, here are your absolutely normal kids right now. Wow. That is one way to tell that story. But close enough, I guess. I mean, it does end with an extra set of four power kids running into the room wearing their normal clothes, much to the amazement of the real power pack. And with a tackle hug onto the parents, the spell is complete. Mirage apologizes for having the parents worrying so long. They forgot that they did this. Really sorry. Send the bill to our school. Care of Magneto. Oh, wait. Our school may have just been blown up again. Yada, yada, yada. Another day in the X-Men. And with one final push of emotion from Gossamer and the real power packs giving a sorry for tricking you folks speech, the parents curl up with the kids onto the bed and fall asleep. Power Pack is so into this fairy tale that they are ready to walk out the door with tears in their eyes to become wandering Shaolin monks or something. Mirage has to remind them that the kids in the bed are just illusions that she has created. And as soon as she reclaims her dream spear, poof, the replicants are gone, leaving behind four spots in the bed that the real children can take. And once settled in and peacefully asleep with a little Gossamer assist, Mirage takes her team away with a final thought that it is time for the Power Pack to be children again. The beginning. Next issue. The boogeyman is gone. Or is he? His shadow hangs over Julie's graduation as she has to decide. Is she child or hero? Who am I this time? Is she man or Superman? Is she a cover? Or is she the beginning of this book? We shall never know. But we will find <laughs> out about the power pack packaging. <laughs> Wait a minute, the cover in the beginning of this book is the same thing. You were trying to who's gallow me. <laughs> so, we have got a uh, nice little book here, and we have the lovely cover done by our favorite pair, Bog and Barda. We have in the little corner box, instead of Power Pack, we've got Boogeyman's face, which is about the only Boogeyman we see in this, which is kind of creepy. It's that very creepy and ugly face from a couple issues ago. But we have Aftermath and Power Pack, and we got the little triangle box in the corner with Inferno Continues, Revenge of the Boogeyman mm -hmm. Part 3. We've got the Power Parents looking very sad, standing on top of Ruth as the Power Kids fly away, and the Power Kids all have tears in their eyes, and you see the new mutants flying on Warlock Spaceship, and they've all got these creepy smiles on their face. Yeah. Things I forget you're forgetting as well. Alex is carrying a suitcase, you're indicating that they have a, a suitcase full of money. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Everybody's very sad that the kids just had to resort to stealing from their parents to afford to go away to mutant school. Hey, that place is expensive. If, still, if, if it hasn't been blown up, no, it's been blown up. I remember this time yeah, in Inferno. It's been blown up. <laughs> it's been it's been blown up good. It's been blown up very good. Kind of building up from where we're at. From before, it's like, okay, the kids are flying off, kind of, you know, seeding the things. Oh, they've flown off to go and live at Xavier's school for the gifted mutants. And, you know, the pirate thing kind of builds up to that. So I like this cover. It's very striking. It's very interesting. I think the only part I don't really like is the four smiles that the new mutants have. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, it's uh, especially Warlock, who's got kind of a, a Daffy Duck face that's just like, Hoo -ha! It is, uh, it's this weird juxtaposition of a very sad family and then uh, 
four wacky goofballs out on another high flying adventure kind of thing. It's it's it it's a weird juxtaposition. Yeah, I I, I would have rather had just the Nemeans have neutral faces. I think they've been fine, and I think that would have made this perfect as far as the cover goes. Yeah. In the meantime, it, it kind of makes it makes you think that oh, the new mutants are happy that Power Pack is going to be sure. coming and joining them, and their buddies are going to be living on site with them, and they can hang out all the time. Yeah. What, what do you think about this issue? Actually, let's let's start and talk about what we think about the ending of this issue. How do we think how this book ended? As in, uh, is it a good way of? You know, is just like resetting so that the parents don't know and they can go back to doing whatever stories they have. Or do we think it's a cop out yeah. or something along those lines? Okay. Um, I might have liked to have seen a little bit more of the parents in the know. So I feel that this is kind of rushed because it's very much like ending of previous issue. We had like one full issue of the parents knowing that the kids had powers, but honestly, the, that, didn't count because the parents were kidnapped during that right. time and three quarters of that time they were unconscious. Uh, so we've only got to experience them now. And it's like, and we're still in the middle of the trauma. Yeah. I really don't know how I feel about the ending of this. It is definitely, it's a definite way of telling a story and to reset it so that like, Oh, you know, uh, I made my Mephisto deal and now it's one more daytime and now nobody knows again. I, I think I'm, I think I'm with you. I think I would have liked a few more issues of the parents trying yeah. to deal with this, of them having some serious issues of, you know, maybe getting life back to all normal. It's like, okay, we're back to a regular day now. And like, the parents are trying to deal with their work, but they can't deal with work. Are they trying to? They're trying yeah. to deal with the family. They're trying to talk about. It. They they try a few different ways, and then we get into something with the new mutants. Where I, I like the way that the new mutants solve this. I think it's a very yeah. clever use of a couple of different powers to trick the parents, which is what they're doing, which is bad. Yeah. But at the same time, I like the narrative structure about how that worked. I think I would have liked to have it about two or three issues down. I agree. I also would have liked to have seen the emotional breakdown, the, uh, you know, the traumatic experiences, like kind of like the parents decline, kind of ramp up a little bit slower because you know, I could see them just being like, OK, oh, my God, I'm glad they're here. We, we just need to be normal, yeah. you know, like an issue or two down, you know, and then you could kind of hold it that look, just don't tell me about it. Just, you, you were in bed all this time. Everything was great. You're fine. You you just went right. out. You were on patrol. You didn't fight aliens. That's I don't want to hear about it. And then like two three issues in, then you could get into the just you know the complete breakdown that the parents have had. At which point, then the kids could have been very much like, oh man, this is just the worst outcome that possibly right. could have happened. And then have the interactions with the new mutants, and then yeah, have the new mutants come in and do what they did. Yeah, I, I agree. I I think that that's probably the only failing of this book is that we're missing some great. Great fertile ground for a storyline in the midst here. I think I think that the book is fine. I just think that the solution has come too quickly. We we need to have more. We need to do more stuff with. It. Kind of a bummer because it was you know we've been building up to this for forty four yeah. issues. We should we should really play around in this sandbox a bit more before we get there. Yeah, I agree. I fully agree on that. Yeah, it uh, it did. It needed to. It needed to last a couple more issues. One thing I will say that I do like, and I I I mean I've owned this book for a long time. I've read this a few times and I read it a couple times even before the show, but my last reading of it, I finally got the kids' reaction on the last page where they're they're crying and they're saying that they're ready to go away too now. That they are that yeah. they have fallen into the same mind trap that Mirage and Gossamer have woven. It's because Gossamer has done this whammy, not just to the parents, but to kind of everybody there, except for maybe the new mutants. But her power is that good where she's, you know, saying, you know, she's selling this this fiction that the kids in bed are the real kids and that, you know, it was all fake. And she's woven this so thick. The power kids are just part of it at that point. And it's Mirage that says, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. You, This is how we're playing this game. That's why their reaction is so strong there that they are crying. They're like, oh, well, we're done. We're, we're, we're just going to leave our parents and they're going to. OK, I, I still didn't even pick up on that. I just figured they were kind of like, yeah, just I guess we're going to go live with the new mutants or we should. I guess we're leaving now. I could see it less as Gossamer intentionally doing it to him mm. and more of it's uh, maybe it was kind of they were in, you know, they were shocked by like we're here. We're being replaced. They're kind of in that mindset. And then maybe there was some slippage. Yeah. 
like a little bit of the empathic slippage going out. I, I agree yeah, that I, I don't okay. think Gossamer did it on purpose, but I think that that's part of the story. So I kind of like it a little bit more okay. from that. And it, it helps me sell – for me personally, it helps me sell the, the lie that they're they're weaving over this. So I do like that. Okay. I hadn't picked up on that. I like I like your thoughts. Good brain on you, Rick. Thank you very much. It's my no prize. Um, <laughs> you kind of talked about this a little bit, but let's go a little bit deeper into it. You were talking about how the parents' reactions have ramped up. What do we think about the overall characterization of the parents in this and about how they're reacting? I mean, you, you kind of said already that you think that it came a little too fast, but... I feel like it did, though they had just had like 12 hours of nothing but torment and shock and Inferno on Earth. So... I can understand why you know, they were kidnapped by a big lard monster. They, I'm going to throw you to your death, but I'm going to beat you up a little bit first. Ah, all this stuff's going on. So they have had massively traumatic experiences going on. So I totally get that. But from an observer's point of view, it just seems like it was kind of rushed storytelling. I like a little bit more of that slow burn. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like the, the classic, you know, Tarantino, the table scene where a bunch of people are just sitting around talking. Yeah. But... The talking's going on, but it's really on kind of two levels. Like, it's like, yeah, this is going on, but this is going on, and it's kind of building to a head. Yeah. And I, w I would have liked to have seen more of that here, because it basically, basically, this kind of set that table scene, and then just immediately brought out Tommy Guns and everybody died, kind of thing. It was like, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of, there was a couple of pages of quasi buildup, but basically it just, it, you know, I liked it when it was kind of doing the, oh, kids, you're home. But then, you know, showing them where it's just, or like, you know, the previous uh, issue where they, the kids are like, we're going to go off and save some people. And they're like, okay, kids, we'll be fine. And then they have the breakdown. Right. And I kind of like that too. When the kids come home, they're like, hey, you know, they, they were a little like, hey, we're a little too fake happy. But I liked that kind of table breakdown that they had. We, we've discussed it. I would have liked a slower ramp up and had it lasted a little bit longer. I, I think I think if we can't have that, I still think that the characterization was good. I think that oh, yeah. Julianne Jones, who's Louis Simonson's daughter, I think she did a pretty good job with the script. I think she did a great job writing it. And I think that June Brigman's art helps sell this big time. I think that yeah. her char her artistic expression of the parents and their faces and the reactions is just amazing. I, I love her art and I've missed it. She's very, yeah. very good in this issue. What's funny on it is that it almost looks kind of weird now because I got used to somebody else's art. So Yeah, we, we've had different people kind of come in and there. Yeah, and she's been away from it for, uh, man, a good, like, 30 issues almost kind of thing. So Yeah, but it's it's nice seeing her back and seeing kind of how she's grown over time, too. So Oh, yeah, it, it's really nice. We also have the New Mutants in here, and I my comment on the New Mutants is, I'm not entirely sure why we needed Sunspot, except at this point in time, he was hanging off of Gossamer's arm, and Warlock was there to transport them around. But we didn't need those two. We only needed Mirage and Gossamer, because th there are no talking in there with those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there was a uh, Katie interacting with Warlock, which was cute. It was in the just background. As, yeah, yeah, it was a, a background. It was just like it was Warlock being all excited that Kate, you know, cell friend Katie was there, and da da da, you know, yeah. Uh, and, and uh, I just love Katie because she's all like, you're my cell friend too, Warlock. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's really cool. And then Sunspot was there so that him and Jack could awkwardly interact with each other. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, Jack could, in the background, make fun of him while they were doing, like, demolition work. Because Sunspot's, like, all, you know, powered out and straining to lift stuff up. And there's just a Jack in the background just smiling, lifting, lifting up building chunks and stuff. Like, <laughs> what are you having problems with? <laughs> yeah, they, they just were... In my mind, in my memory of this book, I always thought that the New Mutants had a much bigger presence. And Mirage and Gossamer are very important to the end of the story. But yeah. I was, like, reading the book, and I was like, hey, we're, like, over halfway in here, and the New Mutants haven't shown up yet. Oh, here they are. And they just yeah. kind of breeze through, like, about four or five pages. <laughs> but Yeah, they cameoed in. They did a little bit better than a Spider-Man cameo. And I was even planning on having one of the guys from Battle of the Atom come on and talk about this book, but really, there there ain't much for them to talk about about this book. Yep. We, we could have had Zach in for uh, a good three minutes where he said, and then the new mutants show up until they leave. Bye, Zach. <laughs> Bye, Zach. Hi, Zach. Bye, Zach. So, yeah, uh, hopefully I'll get him on a different episode. But, yeah, yeah. it was kind of was a little bit of, of nothing. I like seeing the new mutants here. I love the interactions with... Power Pack of the New Mutants. Unfortunately, this is about it because, uh, well, kind of after this, that's when uh, the New Mutants start to really turn into 
uh, a paramilitary organization, and pretty soon Cable shows up, and well, then we got X Force. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's a little less interactions with Power Pack at that point in time. Mm -hmm. That's what I had written down. Is there anything that you want to talk about about this book? Okay, well, about the only thing that I could think of uh, to bring up is that the doctor that the New Mutants and Power Pack interacted with, who kind of became like, I guess I'm in charge of the hospital because I'm the, I'm the last one standing. Yeah, he, he he's, looks like he's from India. He looks like he's from India. When Mirage created his idealized workforce, they were all Hindi as well, which I thought was interesting. So all the medical professionals were Hindi and all the construction workers were Hindi. So it was interesting to me just to see like, Oh, okay. We're not doing, you know, the Caucasian cultural bias of, well, generically, everybody in a comic book is white. This yeah. was kind of neat because they actively went through and said, we have a, a Hindi doctor and his baseline is, oh, okay, yeah, Hindi. I'm, I'm thinking to myself. And so the fact right. that they tied that in was really, really cool. Yeah. And I also like the fact that it's like, you know, they're, they're all Hindi. And as, as far as the line of medical professionals, you have a female nurse, a male nurse, and a doctor. Because you can see them, them, it's like a straight line going down, and you can see that they're alternating going through. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice to see that not only is the workforce Hindi or Indian, it's very clear that he's looking for multi-professionals. He's looking for people who are doctors, who are skilled at being nurses, who are skilled at being various levels in the medical profession to handle a variety of different jobs instead of just one job. It's not just... I see a whole bunch of doctors and even mm -hmm. the construction workers. You can see that there's, there's some differences in construction workers. Like one guy's got a hammer and some of the other ones don't. Oh, here's the car one who's going to be working on carpentry. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a mixture of skills that he, he has thought out and it's very precise. And I like that. I do like that a lot. My original thought on the construction workers is that they were cookie cutters all the same, but then actually looking at them again, I was like, Oh no, they're all different. They're all men, yeah. but they all look different. I'm like, oh, okay. Right. And then even further on when you're seeing them work, you're like, oh, they all have different features. Okay, that's kind of neat. And you know what? I'm going to just go ahead and take right off from what you're saying. Then I'm going to move on into my library card. Looking at this hospital scene, I thought of something. And it did cause me to do some research online. And that involved a lot of reading, so I'm going to use it. Power Pack and the New Moons helped the hospital staff expand their facilities until the Army Corps of Engineers showed up to help out. And that is what I want to talk about. Being a veteran of the Army Reserves, I was in a combat engineer unit. And while I was never activated, I was part of a couple of different units that were trained to participate in missions through the Corps of Engineers. That is why I wanted to talk about them and what they do. I'm going to read something that I took from the 150.com, and it talks about the history of the combat engineers. Today, the oldest unit in the United States Army is the 101st Engineer Battalion of the Massachusetts National Guard, established in 1636. Although the history of the American military engineering goes back more than 350 years, the heritage of military engineering reaches back to the earliest beginnings of organized armies. On the battlefields of ancient Mesopotamia, India, Egypt, Persia, Greece, and Rome, skilled military engineers laid the groundwork for the role of their modern descendants. During Europe's Middle Ages, the French coined the term genie to represent the engineers. Over the years, genie evolved into the Old English word enginator, meaning one who operates the engines of war, such as siege towers, battering rams, catapults, and the like. With the support of professional French military engineers, our young Army Corps of Engineers was created during America's War for Independence. Today, that French heritage is still seen with our engineer corps. The language of the engineer... Abatis, gabions, fascines, and pontoons has its roots in 18th century France. Even the motto of the American engineers, Essions, is French for let us try. And I would like to point out to the current events. The Corps of Engineers has been activated throughout the United States to help stand up other facilities in association with FEMA to assist the frontline staff with the dealing of the Corona-19 virus. This includes converting arenas, hotels, and other venues into care facilities, thereby increasing the available bed count for treatment. Like all of our armed forces, when you give them a mission and the tools to succeed, you will hear them say, Essions, let us try. That's what I wanted to talk about today. Very cool. And uh, appropriately timely. I thought so myself. The Army has to do what they can do to build hospitals and to build places for the sick to go to. But when it comes down to it, there's only one thing that's really going to uh, help us in the future dealing with something like Corona-19 virus. Magic? <laughs> I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> Science corner, boy. 
Science me, boy! In this issue, Jim and Maggie Power both succumb to the many emotional rigors that they have been forced to endure in a very short period of time. This caused them both to have a mental breakdown from the stresses of this trauma. So this got me thinking. What is post-traumatic stress disorder? Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a psychiatric disorder that can occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event such as a natural disaster, a serious accident, a terrorist act, war, combat, rape, or other violent personal assault. PTSD has been known by many names in the past, such as shell shock during the years of World War I and combat fatigue after World War II. But PTSD does not just happen to combat veterans. PTSD can occur in all people, and an estimated 1 in 11 people will be diagnosed with it in their lifetime. Women are twice as likely as men to have PTSD. People with PTSD have intense, disturbing thoughts and feelings related to their experience that last long after the traumatic event has ended. They may relive the event through flashbacks or nightmares, they may feel sadness, fear, or anger, and they may feel detached or estranged from other people. People with PTSD may avoid situations or people that remind them of the traumatic event, and they may have strong negative reactions to something as ordinary as a loud noise or an accidental touch. For some people, symptoms of PTSD subside or disappear over time. Others get better with the help of family, friends, or clergy. But many people with PTSD need professional treatment to recover from psychological distress that can be intense and disabling. It is important to remember that trauma may lead to severe distress. That distress is not the individual's fault, and PTSD is treatable. The earlier a person gets treatment, the better the likely outcome. So, there is a little bit of information about PTSD, and that is this week's Science Corner. Very well done, sir. I had a feeling you were going to go down that route. I mean, it seemed like it a very... It was hard very, not to. Yeah, it was very hard not to, but... Uh, pop quiz, hot shot! <sighs> what pictures do you want to put on your refrigerator gallery? I don't know. Is there five <laughs> of them? Four of them? What is it? Uh, uh, Jared! Well, you know what? Jason! I, I will challenge you to bring me four. Four pictures. And I will challenge you further to make them half funny and half awesome looking. <laughs> Funny ones can be awesome looking, too. But, you know, those yeah. are the challenges I'm throwing in front of you. So, pop quiz. What is your piece of artwork in this book that needs to be up on the family refrigerator? Well, my first answer for a joke backup one would be on page 13. And I call it knocking down those new car prices. <laughs> and that is the bottom <laughs> it is the bottom center panel and this is after uh, Alex has woken up in a sleepy demon car and it has uh, woken back up and it's getting ready to attack you know the two power boys and the old man and uh, it's got Jack there ready to fend it off with a super posy G punch it's a demon car it's a car that's up on its back wheels its legs and it's got a, <laughs> its grill as a giant maw of jagged teeth and I'm like ah yeah, fight that car, Jack. I'd like to ask uh, June Brinkman, like, uh, June, when you were asked to draw a demon car, what was your first thought? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Inferno, June Brinkman. Hope yeah. you survived the experience. What what car inspired you to demonize? <laughs> How about you? What's your backup joke? You know, let's stay let's stay in the demon section here, and let's move forward to page sixteen. And I was trying to figure out which one of these I really wanted to do, but I ended up going with the version on page sixteen, and I call this the evil version of my neighbor Totoro's cat bus. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. This is this is actually my favorite piece of art in the book. Oh yeah. Yeah, not even a funny. This is my favorite piece of art. I called it uh, Bleecker Street Beatdown. <laughs> it's like the face of the bus, and it looks like a big. You know, Maw, and it's got the headlights are eyes, and Alex is ready to face off, and Julie's there in cloud form, holding it back with bubble force field. And it's just, I'm like, that just looks cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. I found it very funny, and I just was thinking of my neighbor Totoro, and yeah. I was thinking of the cat bus, and I was trying to figure out which one I wanted to do, and I ended up going with that one because it's such a good picture. Oh, yeah. Now, honestly, uh, I think all my pictures are funny in one way or another, so it's kind of like, <laughs> this is my favorite. It's also funny, but it's my favorite, so... <laughs> Tell me your top funny one, then. Uh, my top funny one is on page six, and I call it, It's Raining Demon! Hallelujah! <laughs> And this uh, is the almost full panel uh, scene in which uh, a hole in the sky is opened up and all the demons from Limbo are being sucked up into it. But if you didn't know any better, it could be raining demon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so that's my, uh, my top funny. How about you? Well, I'm going to go back to page four. I'm surprised you didn't choose this one because I, 
I was sure that you would have seen this one. Uh-huh. And this is in the middle on the right-hand side. Oh, yeah. And I call this one, Grandma Got Gas. <laughs> <laughs> I I looked at this one several times. I just went a different direction. <laughs> I never even named it. <laughs> I was just like, I like this one a lot. Meh. It's the grandma harpy, and she's kind of she's fallen out of the sky, and Julia has thrown down her cushion of bubbles, and she's bounced out of the bubbles and is in front of them. But from this angle, because she's kind of hunched over, and the bubbles are right behind her, and there's a big <laughs> and it looks like grandma got gas. <laughs> Grandma got a bad Grandma, gra- Grandma got gas. <laughs> Tell me what your backup best one is, My sir. backup best one is on page three, and it relates to what your uh, your top funny one was, because pick the one on page three, and I call it Bad Grandma. It is the bottom right-hand panel, and yeah. it is where the grandma has started to transform into her uh, demon harpy self, and her hands got all clawy, and her mouth got all huge, and... Yeah, I just I just like the way that looked. Yeah. That transformation from grandma to, to demon is great. That was going to be one of my funny ones. I was going to call that what big teeth you had. Because, you know, what big teeth you Indeed. do have. Well, I got a tiny little bit of a cheat one that I'm doing for my best backup one. And it is on page nine. And it is the bottom two panels with Jim Power. And the first panel is him kind of admitting that, yes, they're... What's the point? We have to behave as if nothing's changed. And he's kind of depressed. And the next one, he's moved his head up. and He's got that fake smile on. So it's like he goes from depressed and resigned to forced smile. And I love these two pictures. Oh, yeah. They are. You can see all of the lines on his face. You can see the forced smile. You can see the heavy shadows of sorrow in the part one. And the two pictures together are just gorgeous. Yeah. It, and it's all about the eyes, too, because in the... He's, in the first one, he's got head down, and his you can't see his eyes. The, you know, it's like yeah. they're in shadow, and the reflection on the glass is obscuring your view of his eyes. But as soon as he, you know, so it's just like, he, yeah. you can. T- it, that's just a way of going, you're not seeing into his soul because he is just wrapped up in his own head. But when he looks yes. up and kicks on the fake smile, those glasses are crystal clear. You can see through, you can see his eyes, and they're just, they're too wide open. They're too excited, just like, everything's fine. That's why my eyes are so wide open. Yeah, it, that that's a good choice. Those are really yeah. good choices. And if that wasn't cheating enough, let me tell you about mm-hmm. my top choice. Because my top choice is really cheating. Yes. You ready for it? Page two and three. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Big spread of the kids fighting the demons, and you've got everything going on mm-hmm. here. you got Katie zooming around and saving people. Alex shooting out fireballs everywhere. Julie bouncing up. we got four times, and you kind of kind of see her, her cloud being the trails of where she's bounced at. And then you got Jack just doing some, you know, three punch sock on some demons and knocking them out. There is so much going on in this picture. It's fabulous. There is a lot happening here. You are right. Yeah, it's... I was looking at this one and I'm like, there's too much. It's too busy. I can't pick a certain thing. There's a lot of great stuff happening here. I like it a lot. I I like all of it. This is a good issue. I know Rick's going to do a a cheat choice at least (laughs) once in here because there's enough things where there's like leading into each other where it's like, yeah, my choice is these 19 panels. So... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I, the the gym one's the real cheat one, but I think it's it's a great juxtaposition between the two pictures. Anyways, that's what we've got for there. Yep. Since I am such a cheater, cheater, McCheater pants. Yep. That was my name in high school. So, um, you know, Jeff, take that, you old bat. Ouch. On page four. Yeah, that's my backup <laughs> one as well. That is a jack line after he's clobbered the harpy with his. Take that, you old bat, hee hee. Yeah, that's a good one. That's my backup too, buddy. Yeah. I, 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 I We might have the same ones here because I think that there's not too many insults in this book, amazingly Yeah, there's enough. like three insults in mm-hmm. this book. So, yeah, probably are going to have the same ones. So, on page 22 is my first place one. Yep. And uh, this is Gossamer. And Jack. <laughs> who is leaning, who's leaning away from a very angry sunspot. <laughs> and Gossamer is saying, so handsome, how old are you? Yeesh, get your cooties away from me. Cripes, girls, fooey, hick. Yep. You know, Jack, you weren't acting like that at all <laughs> when uh, you, you saw Ileana a couple of issues ago. Yeah. What up? 
Yeah, no doubt. Actually, I gotta say, Jack's got good taste. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> Go for the dark child, not the uh, alien not the who was sent alien. here to break up the new mutants <laughs> until she gets her parents back so they can continue to transform into giant hulking behemoth monsters. You read way too much about Gossamer, really. It's a very short <laughs> wiki article, man. <laughs> there's, there's, there's not much that you need to know. Yep. About her. So that's what we have for our insults. Let's move on to stars in detention. And this is going to be another one of those kinds where I'm very interested because I didn't know where to go myself. Jeff, start us off. Tell us about who your worst child was. Okay. My worst is, I am assuming it's going to be your worst as well, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yep. It seems like his decision to take the pack out instead of staying at home with his parents. Yeah. So, yeah, bad job, Alex. Yeah, he did that. Uh, there was more to it than that, too. But there were several times where he was just like, no, mom and dad are fine. We can go leave. We can go leave them. They're fine. They're safe. They're fine. It's okay. He did that quite often. But there was also just the aspects of like, oh, he learned a lesson from dis- trying to disintegrate part of a car. It turns demon if he disintegrates it. <laughs> Okay, well, this is one person being threatened by a car. Now there's a bus full of people in a demon bus. What are you going to do to get them out? I know. The exact same thing that will trigger the demon energy is to make it a demon again. Alex, come on. Even Jack knows that's a (laughs) no-no. Alex had some of the best introspection in here, but everything else was just bad. So Yeah. And he wouldn't have had to have that introspection if he had just, you know made better choices to begin with well (laughs) our theme for alex is you need to make better choices to begin with (laughs) yeah pretty much which isn't always true but yeah it happens quite frequently and that's because you know it's you put the characters you love into torment and so yeah that's what's going on there but speaking of Mm -hmm. making better choices yes who has been making better choices who is our best child Yeah, I believe that it is Julie. We are in agreement. Okay. Why do you think Julie? She, from the get-go, was more concerned about their parents. It's like, our parents have something going on. This, we know what's happening, and we know we should deal with this. And it's like, no, let's just get out of here and said, we really shouldn't go. We should be with our folks. So, big part right there. She was constantly on, on the push for, it's like, no, are in trouble. We need to be there for them. That's a huge one. Also, yeah. she saved Katie because Katie, when you know, like, yeah. got knocked out of the sky by the harpy and by the Powerball, Katie saved her. Uh, Julie saved Katie with the force field bubbles. Julie was also the one who stopped the bus with her force field stuff, so she saved a lot of lives. Yeah. Then, then she made pillows and beds for people, which is it's not it's not real. It's not super dramatic. It's not like in the retelling of the of the dramatic story, but super useful. She gave comfort to. People that were injured. Yep. Use your powers where you can. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, I loved how she took down the bus and how she really flexed her powers. I'm a complete yep. agreement on that. I, I had to go through it a few times and I realized, yeah, I, I, Julie's the one. Julie's I was the kind one. of the same way. I was, uh, it, in fact, it wasn't until today that I figured out my best and worst kid. I kind of had an inkling that I'm like, yeah, my worst kid's probably going to be Alex. But in rereading it today, I was, but for the best, I'm like, everybody was fine. I'm like, yeah, everybody's doing great. Katie might have it. Yeah, Katie might have it. She's, well, you know, really, it's Julie. Yeah, it's Julie. I am not trying to go out and blame Alex for everything. I really am not. It just always happens that way. It happens a lot that way. We have got another interesting dilemma in front of us, and that is, where do we want to place this book? We have ourselves here a ever-growing list from our favorite book in the series and other stories, all the way up to 49. In 49, we have X-Factor Annual number 2. In rank number 40, we have Power Pack 15, Reckoning. Upon number 30, we've got Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, 205, the awesome Barry Windsor Smith issue, mm-hmm. Wounded Wolf. And uh, number 20, we've got Power Pack number 13, Fireworks. That's with a baseball game one. And number 10, Power Pack number 43, Ha ha ha, the one before this, Boogeyman Must Die. And of course, top of the list, wow, Power Pack number 42, Revenge of the mm-hmm. Boogeyman. So we got number one, Revenge of the Boogeyman. Number 10, the second part of that story. Does this fit in between those two? Do you have a feeling on that? Because I have a feeling, and I can tell you that right now. Why don't you tell me your I feeling? I do not think that it is in between those two. I think it is closer okay. to the middle of our list than to the top. All right. That is my personal feeling. So let's go down below uh, Mm -hmm. fireworks. Do we like this more or less than our number 20? Or you think it's going to go a little bit further down? I was thinking it was going to go a little bit further down. I was looking around uh, like 28, honestly. 
27 is Problems, and that's their first run-in with the Morlocks. And 28 is uh, the New Mutants crossover, Danny huh. Fights Death to Save Maggie. And I believe that there's... That's an interesting yeah, choice. That's yeah, because New choice. Mutants are there, and I believe that there's demons in that one, too. Yes, there is. So that's that's a good one to put this up against, is do we like that story better than this one? Yeah, it, putting it up against that story in this one, I really do think that this one is a little more polished than 20. Okay. I think that 20 has got some... There's a bit more in e- unevenness during that New Mutants fight. That's where Danny fights death to mm-hmm. save Maggie, and the kids are trying to save the... Uh, it's the demon's first attempt at opening yes. the portal that would eventually become yeah. Inferno. So very interesting choice for that one. I do think that this is a little more polished. I think that there is a bit more... That the storytelling's a little bit stronger in this one. Even though we think that the result is rushed as a whole with mm-hmm. everything else, I think by itself, it's a pretty good it story. Is. So I think I'd be willing to put it right above mm-hmm. that one. I think it is a great choice. It is the new number 28. Excellent, excellent, mm-hmm. excellent. Uh, across the internet, I cheers you, my friend. Uh, Prost. Clink. Prost. To Power Pack <laughs> and Friendship and our listeners who we appreciate immensely. Here's to you. But before we can get out to, you know, really cheering the listeners we need to uh put a little grade on this beer i have opinions on it do you have opinions on it i do i do have opinions on it i am um, i have a feeling that your opinions are going to be less than mine i'm enjoying this beer i i think it's pretty good i still stand by it being a really nice mix with a good pork mm-hmm. chop i think it'd be taste great with that actually i could also see uh Maybe cooking the pork chops oh, in this, too. Oh, I that. Yeah, it would probably make a really good beer bread, too. I think keeping that in mind, I- I'm enjoying it. The taste has kind of grown on me as it's gone along, and I've I've enjoyed it a bit more. I'm willing to say this is a good three and a half or four for me. I, I would, um, I think I would go three and a half. By itself, it's not that good. If I was drinking this with mm-hmm. eating something, it would be a four. But I'd say three and a half for me. The flavor for me has kind of remained constant. It is a peppery lemon. In all honesty, it is. It yeah. starts lemon, it goes peppery, and then it kind of gets a little kind of uh, must isn't the right word, but you know, it kind of like dims down into a little bit of kind of like a stale beer flavor. But it, it's pleasant. It's nice and light, like you were saying. It would go great. It would go great with food. But the big problem that I have with it is that I find it hard to drink in the sense of physically because it continually froths up. It's like I pour some into my mouth and it just. Mm-hmm. Just it stops being liquid and goes into a froth, and then it like um, it like goes up my nose and everything, and I'm like, better not explode it out of my mouth because I sipped a beer. Okay, I've been able to swallow <laughs> the foam down, but now I got to get all the foam off my throat. So I dislike it for that, but I'm also actually I'm at a three and a half with it. Oh, good, good. Well, matchless brewing shared table three and a half from us. Still not a bad showing for that beer. And now that we've talked about. Not a bad showing. Let's talk about a good showing in kids' perspective, (laughs) where Rick talks to his daughter, Carrie, about the issue that we just covered. So, Rick, Carrie, tell us tales about what you think. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Daddy. How you doing? Good. Are you having a nice day? Yeah, you know why? Because I spend it with... I can spend it with you and Mommy. Well, that's pretty nice then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So, we have got a new book here, correct? Yes. And this one is all about, um, well, tell me what this one's about. So, Power Pack just came back from fighting some demons and stuff, and then they come home and their parents are really upset, stuff like that. Then they go, um, back out because they, there's still some stuff that's demonized. Yeah. And so they save people, and they run into the new mutants. Mm-hmm. And then when they get back home, their parents are all still sad and really sad, sad, sad. <laughs> Just really sad. But um, the new mutants helped them with uh, with their parents, and now their parents are back to not knowing they have powers. Right. It dealt a lot with the relationship between the parents and Power Pack and them having powers, right? Yeah. How did their parents react? Their parents weren't that happy. I mean, they were like... It didn't look like their parents were dealing with it well, right? Right. The Nemeans tricked them, correct? Tricked the parents into pre- believing that they were not really... They didn't really have powers, right? Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about the book overall? Did you like it or not? I liked it. 
Was there any parts that really stood out to you that you really thought were really cool or really interesting? I kind of liked it when um when we saw all of the demonized like cars and stuff like that and trains. They're kind of cool. <laughs> Is there any parts that you didn't like too much? Mm, not really. Do you like the fact that the parents are back to not knowing about the powers? I don't know. I don't think that would have been a great, great idea. But, of course, their parents were acting all strange and stuff, so... Do you think it could have gotten better over time? Eventually, yes. I mean, they would get used to it. Would you rather the parents know about the powers, or would you rather them to continue to hide the powers from the parents? I would like them to know about their powers for a little bit longer, like, you know, so so they can actually... So it can actually get a little bit better over time. Interesting. You know, and then, then eventually it will, they'll be back to normal, kind of. That's very interesting that you said that, because that's kind of the same conclusion that Jeff and I had when we talked about it, too. So, hmm. very nicely done. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Not really. Okay. That's all I have for you, then. Thank you very much, Carrie. You're welcome. I love you. Love you, too. Ah, Carrie, that is very insightful. Thank you so much for joining us. Shout out time! You sound like Homer Simpson. So that's what my voice sounds like in a uh, in a uh, paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> we like to recognize those listeners that take the time to write in and leave us a review. This is for episode 54, where we covered Power Pack 41, Smoke Out. AJ, who provided this comment that made us chuckle. Sliding timeline dictates that instead of cigarettes, Alex went out on a crusade against vaping. True story. Al Sedano and Resurrections, an Adam Warlock and Thanos podcast. Andrew Burns. Charlie Rose. Chris at BTO Bat Books. Charles Gears. Charles Miller. Comic Reflections and Nicholas Prom. Ed 209. Green Lantern HG. The Hammer Strikes. Hoover Jeremiah and the 4,000 Million Years Later podcast. Jeff Polier. Jeremy Daw. The Long Box Crusade featuring Pat DJ Christatos Sampson. New Warriors Talk. Patrick Carey. Rustin LF. Secret Wars and Beyond with Sean. Stephen Gray. Tim Christ. Dun, 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 dun. The Pod Crasher. We see the world in Ben Day Dots. Jeff and Rick Presents is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in a quarantine lab, steep underground Portland, Oregon. <laughs> if you would be interested in interacting with us, you can do so through the magic of the internet. You can do so through Twitter at Jeff Rick Presents, our Facebook page, Jeff and Rick Present, our email address, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word, at gmail.com, or at our website, Jeff and Rick Present, dot WordPress dot com. Also, our YouTube channel at Jeff and Rick Present. Are you noticing a theme? It's Jeff and Rick Present. And if you would like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com Jeff and Rick Present. All one word. We are also a proud supporter of the Hero Initiative, and we will be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to HeroInitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. It really does help. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We, we love, love you. you. Until next time. Costumes, costumes off. Our theme music is 80s action. Also featured in this episode is Spider's Web and Chucky the Construction Worker. All music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. Now that they know their kids have power... Mm-hmm. And it is insane! I mean, not only are there actual demons, but there are also limb... Blumpf. What's that? <coughs> What'd you say? Uh, I, I, I coughed and then whatever. I didn't say okay. anything. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, okay. I, I said, your mom is a chiraptora. <laughs> You're a chiraptora. Blumpf.
Yeah, well, think space balls and the shield around the planet, and Mega Maid pulling all the air out of the hole. That is kind of what is happening to the demons. Well, that sucks. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. That, 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 all right. That line's funny enough to stay in there. Plumph. Sure enough. Let me try it again. Show sure enough. Jim and Maggie are still up <laughs> sitting enough. at their kitchen. <laughs> Who runs Power Town? Show sure enough. Show sure enough. <laughs> Who's the biggest, <laughs> brightest scientist in that house? Show sure sure enough. enough. <laughs> Who's got four kids with space horse powers? Show sure sure enough. enough. Show sure enough. <laughs> Show sure enough. Show sure enough. <laughs> Plumph. Send the bill to our school. Care of Magneto. Nito. Nito. Plumph. Hoover, Jeremiah, and the 4,000 Merillion. Blah. Hoover, Jeremiah. Hoover, Jeremiah, and the 4,000 million year old later. Why can't I say 4,000 million years later? I don't know.